Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sin and Ends of God Highway Ministries. Uh, it's Thursday morning. Usually, Pastor John English is preaching to us, and uh, he's uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, spending an extra little time with his family. And I expect they're probably uh, done a little celebrating today after the news that they got. So... Um, I decided to, I've had something roll around inside me for a, about a month and been been waiting for the right time to, to do it. It's really, really nothing special. I just, uh, just kind of kind of go over my life a little bit and give an updated testimony about myself. And uh, yesterday, uh, Brother Dave from uh, A Walk Closer uh, asked me to give a testimony uh, last night, actually, and uh, I couldn't do it last night, and I thought that that probably worked out better anyway because I wanted to give it up here first, and uh, so I'll try to remember everything I was going to say. I didn't bring my notes or anything, so Lord, we just come before you right now, and we just thank you for this time together. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will Bring to my remembrance everything that you want said today, Lord. I pray blessings over each and every person and each and every ear that hears. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I'm just going to go over some of this. Some of this, uh, a lot of you have already heard before, so I'll just touch on it and not try to stay in one spot too long. But uh, I moved to, uh, we moved to the area where I live now, around Old Grove and, and Grain Valley. Uh, in 1968, and I would have been about eight years old, and uh, we moved on a, a farm out uh, north of Green Valley, between Green Valley and Green Valley in Buckner, Missouri, and uh, we went to a, a little Pentecostal church there in, in, in Buckner. And it was nothing more than a old uh, store, old store building is what it was. And uh, there was probably three or three, maybe four families in that little old church. And uh, I remember, I remember it quite well. Uh, the pastor's name was uh, Jim Bradbury, and uh, his wife Margie, their kids Debbie and Steve. And uh, that uh, that little old church, they just had some old wood folding chairs in it, and there was a they made a couple rooms in the back for kids' Sunday school class. And uh, I remember uh, going to that church, Echoes of Calvary Assembly God. What was the name of that church? I'm going to tell you something. That the, the Lord, the Lord would show up in that little church. Powerful, powerful services. And I still remember old Jim, Pastor Jim Bradbury. He was a, he was a real deal. Now he was, he was a lot of people. There was a lot of people who said he was a little too rough, a little too, uh, preached a little too hard. But uh, I always enjoyed Brother Jim's preaching, and I very seldom. Well, I don't know why I'm struggling with this this morning. Uh I very seldom compare my uh, uh, another without. I never, very seldom see another preacher and not kind of compare them to him a little bit, if that makes any sense. I still remember he always had a suit on and he'd get to preaching. He'd be leaning over that pulpit and he'd have his arm in the air and the sweat beating out on his face and the veins in his side of his temple and his neck was popping out and him a, him just a tearing it up preaching up a blue streak I mean 
I remember one time he was preaching. I, I forget about what the message was, but he was preaching, and he says, if I could reach behind me and pull back this curtain, then you can see the spiritual battle that is going on. He said, it would scare you to death. I'll never forget that. I could just, I could just see that in myself. I could just see that in my imagination or whatever, but I could see that going on. And uh, there was probably, like I say, three or four families, and they got a little money together, and they ended up purchasing us in a, a house over in town there in that same town. And uh, the men in the church uh, come together, and the families, and uh, they remodeled that little house and made it a pretty nice little church. And uh, my dad and some of the other men in that church have done a lot of work on that place and got it, got it where it needed to be. They had that little, little stand in the day. still, still uh, an active church. Anyway, uh, I remember... If I could say power services, seen the seen the move uh, quite a bit in the church healing and different things, and uh, had some good people in the church that could sing and play music. And anyway, my dad uh, is a guitar player, and um, told Pastor Jim he, uh, he he loved my dad. His brother Jim, by the way, he's, he went on to be with the Lord here about. About two years ago, I guess. But uh, I remember uh, the first time my dad uh, brought his guitar to church and sang. And uh, old brother Jim, he he was just a meme. I I don't, I really don't know uh, who was beaming more. Uh, Brother Jim or or myself. Oh, Lord help me here. Anyway, I remember sitting there and seeing my dad get up and the first song I remember. Now, I don't know if this is the first song he sang in church, but it's the first one I remember Now I'm back. I fell off. All right, I'm back, everybody. Sorry about that. Lost my signal. But uh, anyway, he, he, the first song I remember him singing was Old Brush Harbor's by the side of the road. And I uh, learned that song, and I still sing it today. And... Uh, that was just one of several that my dad would. My dad would come and sing on Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings, and then I was, you know, I was a little kid, and oh, it just, it just made me feel good to see my dad up there. And I really felt uh, really felt cool afterwards because kids in church come up to me and say, man, your dad's pretty good. And I go, yeah. And they says, he sing like all the time? I said, oh, yeah. 
he would uh, sing us to sleep every night. He'd say, go get, go get ready for bed, and I'll be up in a minute. He'd come up, he'd say our prayers, and we'd get in bed, he'd, he'd start playing the guitar and singing to it. Those were uh, those were good times for our family. I'm sorry, everybody. I didn't think this was gonna work me over like this. But anyway, those were good times for my family. And as time went on, uh, that little church grew a little bit, and as time went on. Uh, Things started changing a little bit. My dad would start missing a Sunday every now and then. I I really didn't know what was going on at the time. But uh, he started missing here and there. Anyway, uh, by the time I was probably uh, in my mid-teens, I was probably early teens, I'd say. I'm sorry. I was probably 13 or 14. I don't think he was going at all. And uh, he started drinking. And uh, it wasn't too long where he had moved out and was seeing somebody else. He was uh, seeing a woman. As a matter of fact, where our church, where our original church was, was an old store building right next to it, connecting to it, was a liquor store called Golden Arrow Liquors. And that woman my dad started seeing owned that liquor store. And, uh, it turned out, as many of you know, it's uh, it's uh, the, my sister Michelle's mother that comes up here. Michelle was a step, ended up being a stepsister of mine, and and now it's just like family. But uh, anyway, my dad started seeing her and, and get, ended up getting a divorce from my mom. And, uh, things for me started really going to pieces. Uh, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just stating the facts of life of how things went for me. And and if you get to checking things out, uh, kids from broken homes, young boys especially, uh, at that time and that age that I was at, uh, they usually start having problems. And I was at the age where uh, I needed a father figure in my life more than ever. I was just getting pretty close to being 15 years old. And uh, at that point, uh, when my mom and dad got divorced and uh, my dad remarried and everything, it changed everything. My mom had to go to work. Uh, I'm, I'm not beating my dad up by any means. And I'm, I'm telling all this for a reason. And, uh, but I, things changed and it, 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 it caused my mom to have to go to work. My dad pays child support and all, but it still wasn't the type of income that was normally brought into the household. So she had to go to work and she had to work, she had a job at the truck stop there preparing old grove. And, uh, of course, the hours that she, had to work that left me and, and my sister uh, with a lot of free time on our hands. And I basically did whatever I wanted. My daddy got out of uh, construction, went into truck driving, and uh, he was gone even if, you know, he wasn't in the home anyway, but even if uh, uh, he'd have been around more, that might have helped. But 
uh, anyway, like I say, I'm not trying to make my, my dad sound like a bad guy. He, he made some mistakes. And uh, I know he's right with the Lord now, and uh, now I'm not blaming him for the things that I went through. Uh, but I just started doing whatever I wanted. I started drinking. And uh, now this is crazy here. We had a, I, had, I rode a school bus, and I was the uh, uh, last person off of that route in the evenings. And the a janitor, uh, Brother Rick's mom, dro- drove that uh, school bus when we was kids, but they moved on. And anyway, the janitor at the school, um, he drove the bus in the evenings. So I got to spending quite a bit of time with this guy on the bus talking and everything. He's about half crazy. And uh, he would buy us beer. This guy worked at the school, drove the school bus, and we'd get to talking to him, me and Jimmy and and, and Pastor Danny and all of us get talking to him. George, George is his name. We'd pull together our lunch money and stuff like that at, on Fridays, uh, Jimmy Stevenson was the first one old enough to drive, I think. And uh, we'd give him money, and he'd take the he'd go to the liquor store buy where we wanted. And I, we had a spot out out on the back road there, and he would uh, go hide it. And we'd pick it up, and and uh, that's that's when it started. And I started drinking at a young age, and uh, so by the time I was sixteen, I was pretty much out of control. Uh, wasn't wasn't nothing that I wouldn't do, Lord. And uh, I had uh, my dad's family's from Arkansas, and I had uh, relatives down there, and I had cousins, and uh, I had uh, three cousins in particular: uh, Mike, Leo, and Joe, and. Uh, Mike was in the military, and Mike uh, Mike lived with us for a while. I, I left that part out. Mike come to live with us right about the time we moved out to that farm I was telling you about and was going to that little church. Mike come to live with us and live with us for a while. And um, his uh, Our grandparents raised him and his uh, two other brothers, and... Uh, so Mike was the youngest of those, and, and he come and live with us for a while. And anyway, he ended up going back down there. But anyway, uh, when I turned 16, uh, actually when Jimmy got an old drive, we took a we took a trip or two down there and visited them. And it was nothing more than, as you can imagine, it was just a mess of drinking and carrying on. And that's where I was introduced to drugs. Was down there smoking marijuana and, and whatever. Did about everything but shoot up, actually. And uh, that's where I was introduced to that. And I thought that I was uh, pretty cool, and that was a pretty cool lifestyle down there. Come back up here and uh, spend a little time, and I wouldn't work. I wouldn't work. I'd, I might do something to uh, make a little money, but it was all spent on getting high or getting drunk, and uh, I'm kind of rushing through this and this and some spots, but uh, Pastor uh, Danny, that some of you have met, and I uh, know you've heard me talk about him and everything, his brother Greg, France pastor there where they go to church. Uh, he, uh, his mom and my mom, his, his, his mom and dad got divorced just right before ours did, and Danny and I was real good friends in school and everything and uh their mo- our moms became friends and when my mo- mom and dad got divorced things were tight things were tough so they combined the households and we moved from out on the farm into town with them and there they had a bigger house and it was right there by the school and it was actually right behind the school and uh anyway uh long story short we live with them, combine the households, and my mom ended up selling that farm and buying the house right across the street from Pastor Danny and them. So 
from that time frame up to uh, actually uh, my mid-20s or whatever, I stayed right there, in and out of there. And I'd, uh, except for the time frame that I'm getting ready to tell you about. So I was wanting to go back to Arkansas, see my cousins. And uh, I was uh, I was talking to Danny. I said, hey, go down there with me. And Danny, Danny was trying to straighten his life out at that time. And uh, I was like the devil on his shoulder trying to draw him back the other way. He was trying to go the right direction. And he's like, man, I'm tired of this life and everything. And he was living the same lifestyle I was. And uh, he finally gave me, he says, I'll go down there with you. But he says, when you come back, he says, you're going to church camp me, we'll camp with, with me when we get back. And I didn't, I had no intentions of going, but I told him, yeah, I'll do that. So we went down there, and it was just exactly what what I went for. And uh, it was, uh, we were we were wasted the whole time we were down there, several days. And we come back, and it was just a day or two before we were supposed to go to camp, and was ready to go, and I told Danny, I said, I ain't going. I stood him up, and you know, anyway, that's that's the same time Danny went and got the uh, calling on his life to be a pastor, and I didn't go, and I've often wondered what would have happened if I'd have went now that I'm living for the Lord. I've often wondered what would have happened. So, anyway... Uh, we come back and, and school was getting ready to start that, that following fall and I made up my mind I ain't going back to school. And so I had this old car, it was a it was an old Chevy and as a matter of fact I'd got it from my dad, it was one of uh Christie's brothers or Michelle's brothers car and uh he had got something else I guess and anyway I ended up with that car and uh I remember it was right before school was starting. I told my mom, I said, I'm not going back to school. I said, I'm going to Arkansas. I live with Grandma down there and work with uh, Joe and Leo. And she's like, son, don't do that. You know, she tried to talk me out of it. But she wasn't, she didn't get bent out of shape. I guess she knew that there really wasn't nothing that she could do if I just decided that's what I was going to make my mind up I was going to do. But anyway, she, she said, well, let's talk to your dad. So. She called my dad, and, and he'd come over, and that didn't that didn't go too well. He and I ended up out in the front yard going at it, and uh, I left the next day, and was uh, that's how I left uh, relationship with my dad. The last words we said to each other wasn't very pleasant, and uh, I'll forget. I forget how long I was down there because it's just like a blur. And I went down there, and when I went down there, I thought I was going to try to maybe help my grandmother a little bit. She never really had nothing too nice. I thought I'd work with them. They were roofers. I thought I'd go down there and work with them and help her a little bit. And all I did was fall into that lifestyle, cause her more problems than she was already dealing with. And uh, it was just a... Drugs and alcohol, and just got into all kinds of things I shouldn't have been involved in. And uh, I got caught stealing. Uh, I went caught, got caught stealing in a liquor store, and uh, underage. And uh, they called the police. They had they had me in the police car. And the woman come out that owned that liquor store, and it was my my grandmother's. Uh, her knowing my grandmother is the only thing that saved me. She goes, who are you again? And I said, I'm I'm uh, Skip Etheridge. She goes, are you related to Ben and Grace Etheridge? I said, yeah, they're my grandparents. My my grandfather already passed on. And she goes, you're Grace Etheridge's grandson. I said, yeah. And she told she told the police, she said, let him go. I'm not going to press any charges. And... Uh, so I look back at that. God was watching over me then, among other things, car wrecks, other things that I was involved in, didn't get a scratch. Uh, but, but if that woman would have pressed charges against me, that probably would have, who knows where that would have sent me if I'd ended up going to jail or, or 
something like that. But it uh, anyway, for whatever reason, the Lord had His hand in on that, and I did not get in, did not get arrested. But anyway, uh, as time went on, there I got to the point where I thought. You know, I tried to convince myself I was having a good time, uh, but deep down inside, I really knew I wasn't. And I, I had, you know, I called my mom one night, and I know most of you heard this story, but uh, I called her and I just, I told her, I said, I'm, I'm, I can't take it anymore. I'm gonna kill myself. I've had enough. And I was, I was roasted. I was so messed up. And I don't remember everything she said, but she. Uh, she must have said something that made me change my mind. I, just, I guess I just walked off and left her dangling on the phone. She didn't know uh, what to do. She didn't know, I guess, if I was going to go ahead and go through with it or or whatever. But uh, she called my dad in the middle of the night and got him up. It was, it was in the wintertime. The weather was bad between here and there. And uh, so I left there and went over to one of my cousin's house and continued on drinking and everything. And, uh, I was at a, I called her from the payphone and uh, went over to their house, ended up passing out the floor. And uh, the next morning, somebody knocked at the door. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm still about half drunk, and somebody finally opened the door, and there's my dad standing there. Now, my dad, uh, my mom called him about 10 o'clock at night before, and uh, they lived over there just on between, uh, just west of Little Rock over there, between Conway and uh, actually between Mayflower and Little Rock, a little, little community there called Morgan. And uh, so it's it's seven, eight hours back in them days because there was no good way, there was no good road, especially to get down through the mountains there. Uh, so it was seven, eight hour drive on a good day in good conditions. And it had been snowing. It was, it was pretty bad. And my dad, from 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock, he had to get up in the middle of the night. He came over to my mom. My mom let him, she just got a newer car. So he borrowed her car and come and get me. And that, that's kind of like the prodigal son story in the Bible. I, I love that story where the father came running. And mine came running as well. So he he come and got me, rescued me, and brought me home. And I'd like to tell you that we lived happily ever after right there, but we didn't. I put my heavenly father, my earthly father, and my earthly mother's love to the test several times. I'd gotten so far away from uh, living right, that I didn't know how to live right, and uh, I was a, uh, I was a mess. And I just thank God that I got parents that didn't give up on me. That I had parents that took me to church when I was little and got that seed planted. And uh, my. Uh, Oh, I'd say I was probably like that a couple of more years. I finally got about halfway straightened out. I got off taking any kind of dope or anything, and uh, I got a job finally. I still wasn't going to church or nothing, but I know my mom and my sister, uh, other family members, dad, everybody was was praying for me, and... uh, I started slowly straightening my life out a little bit, and I was working, and I uh, I remember uh, 
getting this job and and uh the guy I went to apply for the job I had had hair cleaned down past my shoulders. I went to apply for this job and uh a guy named uh, uh Paul Amen. He had a little company there in Green Valley. It's called Amen Mold. And I went to work for I went and applied for the job and he told me, he says, I tell you what, if a man can get rid of some of that hair I might hire him. So I went back, I went and got a haircut <laughs> and come back and he hired me. And uh that guy, he was something else. And uh showed me all about the business and everything and, and as time went on and I think it was in nineteen eighty four ended up buying that business from him. And uh thought I was on top of the world. And I was for a little bit. But uh I started drinking, I got was got back into drinking, I got back into doing a little drugs and uh I remember I remember a couple of different times, me and, and Jimmy Affalter and Rick, brother Rick, being down there at my shop. Uh, after it was closed up, we'd be in there doing lines of coke and drinking and smoking marijuana. And, uh, it was just it just got crazy. Anyway, long story short, I ended up losing the business. And uh, the bad thing about it is, my mom uh, put up money for me to buy the thing, and so that's money she'll never get back when I signed up finding a bag of money alongside the road or something. But uh, anyway, uh, I just kept on going. Uh, left When I lost the business, I ended up, uh, basically, I was all over the place. Uh, I would live in my pickup. I would stay at my mom's son. I would stay at friends, whatever. And uh, I ended up meeting uh, Kathy. She worked at a bar there in town. And uh, I would I would work a little bit again here. I just worked just barely enough to get by. There was a, a used truck dealer right down the road there from us. And I knew them guys went to school with them. And, and so I would take trucks out west of them for uh, every once in a while. And they would sell them and they'd fly me back home and there was there was a lot of work there to be done, but uh, again, I just wanted enough to keep my my habits going. And uh, anyway, meeting her in, in that beer joint, she worked there, and uh, she was so misled. She <laughs> she thought that I was somebody rich. She thought I was a a rich gambler from California. And no, I did not make that story up and tell her. She put she put it in her mind because the guys that ran that beer joint, uh, the people that own that beer joint, they would have some high dollar, high stake poker games out north of town, and people would come in from all over the country and play in these poker games. And if any of you live around Kansas City, you've seen that on the news uh, back in the mid '80s. They got raided, and uh, it was it was quite a deal, and so she would be in there working, and I had been, I'd be out there uh, taking trucks to California, and somebody be down there at the the bar drinking beer that evening, and and uh, somebody'd say, "Is Skip coming in?" They said, "Yeah, he's flying in from California tonight. I'm picking him up at the airport. He'll be out to he'll be out at the poker game." So she thought I was some hot shot from California, and I just come in for these uh, big poker games and stuff. And uh, so anyway, I got to visit with her and everything, and we uh, dated a little bit, and I ended up actually moving in with her. And uh, she found out the cold, hard truth, but she still kept me around that I didn't have nothing. My address was still my mom's house. And uh, I just kind of bounced around. But she had a house. I moved in with her. She also had four kids. And uh, I was uh, living in sin. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. I know it's wrong. I knew it was wrong when I was doing it. You know, during all this time I'm telling you about, uh, 
deep down inside, I kept I, I knew, Skip, you're messing up. You need to get you need to get it together. But I wasn't listening. And uh, I've always been hard headed. I've always done things the hard way. I've always done things Skip's way. And I've messed up more things. It's like losing that business. There's not a, hardly a day goes by that I don't think about that. Now, I've asked forgiveness for it, and I've asked forgiveness. I've forgiven myself, but I still, every once in a while, now I look back, I looked up the guy that ended up with that business. I looked it up here a while back on the Internet. $5 million a year business. I think he's got 20 employees. And uh, it kind of makes you think, boy, you you sure blew up there. But, you know, you, you, you just never know because had I stayed in that, I might have never met Kathy. I might have not never had Mike or Rebecca. Uh, like I say, Kathy and I was living together, and, and me meeting her, as, as kind of messed up as that was, was the best thing that ever happened to me up to that point. Uh, because it it kind of straightened me out of and her. She was uh, she drank all the time, and, and Kathy was one of these people that didn't need to drink because she would uh, she would be a lovey dovey good mood one minute, and the next minute she'd be ready to tear your head off. And uh, so we both uh, we both kind of got away from the bar lifestyle and everything, and she quit drinking. As a matter of fact, she ended up uh, getting pregnant with Rebecca, and she quit drinking then when she found out she was uh, pregnant with Rebecca. She hasn't drank since. And uh, so that, in turn, led me to, okay, it's time for you to start doing things a little different and start working more steady and and uh, from that point on, the Lord has blessed me with jobs. Each time I change a job, it was a better job, better benefits, until I've ended up here. And uh, anyway, we, we got married and had Rebecca. And uh, a couple of years later, we had Mike. And I ended up adopting her four kids. And uh, I remember everybody, the only person, the only person, told me that I shouldn't do this. My dad told me, don't do it. You're crazy for mar- marrying a woman with four kids. All my friends, all my buddies told me, don't do it. Kathy's dad even told me, don't do it. He asked me more than once, do you have any idea what you're doing? And the day of the wedding, he walked up to me and he said, there's still time to walk out that door. And I wouldn't blame you one bit if you did. He said, if you go through with this, she's yours. There's no refunds. And uh, he asked me once, he said, when I asked if I could marry her, he says, do you have any idea what you're doing? I said, no. If I did, I probably wouldn't do it. But anyway, the only person that didn't give me a hard time was my mom. She was uh, She was happy for us. And uh, now we're getting into uh, probably the biggest regrets of my life. And that's for not raising those six kids up in the church. After all, all the things up. All the things that I've done in my life. The horrible things that I've done. People I've took advantage of, lied to. The lifestyle that I lived. Not bringing those kids up in church is my biggest regret. Again, 
I've asked forgiveness of that. And it took me a long time, but I forgave myself. And now I try to live an example to those kids and be the best example I could be. Because for so long I was, even after we got married, I did pretty good. I done, I did okay. I still drank. And uh, my kids see me drunk. And I wish I wish that had never happened. But uh, I wasn't ever a violent drunk, so that was a good thing. I was always happy in a good mood. I wasn't ever, never got mean or anything. But uh, I, I wish I would have. There was times I sent the older kids to church, but I wouldn't go with them. And you're not, you're not doing nobody. I, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that you're not doing me any good. The perfect in the perfect world, you take your kids and go to church with them. But I did. I would send them, and but I sent them basically just to get them out of the house on Sunday. So, but uh, that's the biggest thing I would change probably right there. Uh, but anyway, as time went on, uh, the Kathy's four older kids I adopted, they grew up and got out of the house. And, and Mike and Becca grew up. And we we moved to where we're at now about uh, 15 years ago. We bought a place in eight acres out there. And, uh, oh, I'd say... Probably about five years ago, the Lord started working on me and started, I mean, really working on me and, and telling me I needed to get my life right, get back in church, get the kids in church. Uh, Mike and Rebecca were the only ones at home, but I needed to get them in church. And so I would go every once in a while, and uh, when we would go, I started going basically by myself, and then uh, Mike, Mike started going with me. And uh, then my wife and Rebecca got to start going. And so the four of us would go, and when we would when we would go, we'd go all the way up to the top and sit in the balcony way in the back where we'd be away from everybody. And uh, that boy, it seemed like every time we was there, a preacher worked me over pretty good. And so we'd miss a little bit and come back again and, and uh, it got to the point where Kathy couldn't climb those stairs and go up the top, so we ended up sitting on the lower level, and that's where we sit now. We sit in the same spot we did back in. And, uh, so we got to going a little more regular, and, and uh, then I drift away from it and back and forth and back and forth. And then uh, I'm going to go into a story here that a lot of you heard again, but Still, some of you hadn't, and there's but this CD stuff we got going on now. Uh, this will be new, new to all you know people that's never heard it before. But uh, things started happening around my house. I was thinking about leaving my wife. Um, her and I was fighting quite a bit. We'd argue on the phone. Uh, there was just a, a real tension around there. And we got to where we were, we would smell a smell in the house. And it was, man, it was a terrible smell. And uh, the best I can describe it, it smelled like cat poop. And then we had a cat. So we just all knew that, that cat had found him a spot somewhere. And was so we, we looked behind the couch, we turned the house over. We turned the house upside down. We could never find nothing, but then it would go away. And uh, so about that time, uh, my wife went to Virginia to stay with uh, Tim. Zach, and some of you met Zach and, and his sister, his uh, dad, once she got there to stay with him to help him. He'd got custody of the kids, and uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. They had been living with us. Zach had went home. Kathy went back out there for a while, 
and was bringing him back, bringing Zach back, okay, because Katie was still with us. And uh, right in that time frame, it was right before Kathy left, is when that smell started, and then she left. And one day, my, my daughter Rebecca was living downstairs. She was sleeping downstairs. And uh, she said that uh, she had a fold-out couch down there, and she said that, that the f- fireplace, that dog would lay and growl at that uh, fireplace. And she said, I'd get a weird feeling down there. Give me the creeps. Well, I got up one morning and went downstairs, and the glass from that fireplace was blown out into the floor. And I was thinking, okay, this doesn't make sense. That heat-treated glass, we hadn't had a fire in there or nothing. I said, that heat-treated glass, does this not, not squirrel or a bird or or nothing? Couldn't break that glass. And it was broken from the inside out. And as we get to putting two and two together, that's about the time we start smelling that horrible smell. And we all we all could smell the smell. We fixed the glass, picked it up, fixed the fireplace doors. Anyway, uh, as time went on, it got to be, uh, it was in about this time of year. It was about this time of year, Rebecca finally came to me. I don't know how long it had been going on, but ever since that, that was, uh, let me think, that was in February. That was around February when that glass got busted out and we got to smelling the smell. So about uh, May, Beck starts telling me the things that are happening to her. She thought she was losing her mind, but she was being tormented by evil spirits, demons, whatever you want to call them. And uh, they would uh, torment her in the middle of the night. They would come up and uh, they would. She could feel them breathing on her face. They would growl at her, and uh, they got so they got to the point where they were getting violent. They would slap her around and stuff like that. And uh, so, and she actually would. Start, would uh, now she was uh, she was the only one that was seeing these and experiencing them. Uh, but we got to uh, putting two and two together that every time this smell was where where we could smell this, that's when this activity was going on. And so um, I was running up to Grand Island at the time, and she told me this, and I really didn't, at first I thought, okay, you know, I really didn't, I knew this stuff was real, but I didn't know if it was really happening to her or not. And she called me one night and she says, uh, "It's just getting, it's getting bad. This is, uh, uh, when she first told me about it, it was getting pretty close to to Memorial Day weekend. I remember that because we had a picnic, and she told me right before that picnic how bad things was getting, and I, I just kind of blew it off." We went to that picnic, played music, and it was up the Elks Lodge. And anyway, I'd come back, and uh, she would tell me bits and pieces and everything, and I would just kind of basically blew her off. I was up in Grand Island a few weeks later, and she called me, and she said, Dad, this is getting bad. She said, this is really getting bad. She told me what happened the night before. Uh, She'd had one uh, appear to her, and she thought it was her older brother, Maya, or her younger brother, Mike. And uh, it took on form. It looked like him standing standing there over her. And uh, as she raised up, she's like, what is he doing? And then she could see his eyes, and she knew that it wasn't him. And she got to hollering and screaming and ended up down the floor trying to crawl down the hall. And anyway, Mike heard her, and he come down and, and picked her up and wouldn't when he come down the hall, they disappeared, and there was there was three of them. There was two smaller ones and a big one, and uh, they'd take on different forms and crawl crawl around on the ground and and different things. And so, I came home 
uh, and that was a uh, that would have been a Monday, if I remember right. That would have been a Monday. Yeah, I got I got back in Kansas City on a Tuesday morning, and when I when she told me what was going on on the phone, I said, "Okay, call your aunt Kelly." She's my sister. I said, call her and tell her what's going on. And I said, in the meantime, get your Bible out. And I told her to read 23rd Psalms. And uh, I said, find you some Christian music uh, and stuff. I said, start playing that around the house. And I said, call, call Aunt Kelly. And she did. And Kelly come over. And she went through the house praying, uh, anointing it with oil demanded to leave, and uh, so she left, and I talked to Rebecca again. She said, I feel pretty good about it, you know. So I get home that morning. I get back about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I walk in, and I could smell just a little bit of that smell. And uh, so I went back to my bedroom and got my Bible, and I come through the house reading the Bible and demanded to leave. I wasn't. I had not rededicated my life to the Lord yet, but uh, like, like I say, right up to this point, the Lord had been working on me to get myself back in church and get myself right, and so it's kind of pointing that direction, and uh, but still having the thoughts of leaving home, leaving my wife, stuff like that, and so I did that, and I went to bed, and the next morning. Uh, Rebecca got up. She said, I, "I feel pretty good." She said, "I slept good last night." She said, "I think, I think everything's cool, you know." So, my sister said, "Let's go up to uh, a Mexican place and eat lunch." And we met her up there, and we got to talking. Now, my daughter and I's favorite thing to do together was watch these horror movies, and uh, she, the latest greatest horror movie that was. That was our deal, or watch that junk on TV now about ghost hunters and stuff like that. And my sister said, I'm going to tell you guys something. I won't make you mad. She said, every time you watch that stuff, you're invited into your home. And she says, you need to get that junk out of there, the, the movies and everything that you've got. You need to get them out of there. So we did. We went home, we got them all, and we took them outside and we burned them. So we're feeling real good about ourselves and everything, and we come walking back in the, inside. I'm going to lay down and go back to work. Kathy is flying back in the next morning. Mike's supposed to pick her up. I come in, I walk upstairs, and as soon as I get top stairs, I can smell that smell. But it's ain't nothing. I just kept walking. I thought, maybe it's my imagination. I just kept walking. I walk around the corner. It's around the corner. I'll, I just look back at Rebecca, and she's standing there at the top of the steps. She's bawling. She's bawling. She says they're back. And uh, I said, oh, boy. So I had went. I don't know. I, I don't remember now what I did, but I left the room and went back to my room for something or whatever. I don't know if I was going to call Kelly or what. But anyway, I come back, and she, at this point, they had started smacking her in the face. And... uh everything, and she says, every time you leave, they start coming at me again. When you come back, they quit. They leave. And I says, okay, I'm going to go out on the porch, and you call me as soon as it starts. So I go out on the porch, and I wasn't out there very long. She's calling. She says, it's happening. So I come back in and go away. So we call my sister. She comes back over. She brings another lady from church with her, and, uh, I had Mike take uh, uh, that lady that came with her, had a little girl, and, and uh, my other granddaughter, Kaylee. I said, take take them and go on, and don't, don't come back till I call you. And so we we stand out in the front yard, and we get to praying, and my sister says, uh, okay, this is what we're going to do. Uh, I wasn't, you know, me personally, I wasn't spiritually ready, ready to handle none of this stuff. And uh, you guys are getting the short version. But uh, my sister said, okay. She said, uh, 
I'm gonna my my daughter, as you can imagine, was just hysterical. She couldn't speak hardly and just crying and she said, I'm gonna go through the house and she said, I'm gonna lead the way and she says, Rebecca, you just come along with me and you keep praying. She says, All I need you to do is say, Yes, I do. She said, Every once in a while I ask you are you coming in agreement with me? And you say, yes, I do. She told me, she said, you just take that Bible and you read. I don't care what you read. You just keep reading. And she told this other lady, she said, you, you just come with me and we'll go through here. And uh, so we took, we went through that basement door. She said, we're going through the basement. We'll work our way upstairs. We went through that door. And uh, I've always been uh, the one that kind of, watched over and protected my little sister. And I'll tell you what, that day when that door come open and the authority that my sister had, when she stepped through that door, it was like you had flipped the switch and she was a whole other person. And the very first The very first words out of her mouth, she said, the great I am. Praise you, Jesus. The great I am sent me today to tell you to leave, and you've got to go. There's no place for you here. There's nothing for you here. And she went through that door like the Marines. And we went through that garage and into the downstairs. And we went through the downstairs. Rebecca said, there they go. She seen them going up the steps. And she could only, she could, the only one that could see them. But the other lady and my sister, the Holy Spirit was guiding them. So when we got upstairs, uh, we went through every room. And we ended up at the other end of the house. And went through there anointing them with anointing on doing every door, every window, every entranceway, even anointing the dog and the cat with oil. And she said, we need to open a, a door. She said, they came in, they need a way out. So we opened the kitchen door. And then we ended up in the dining room area. And we're, we're in there and uh, kind of lost them for a minute. Rebecca goes, I don't know, I don't know. And... Uh, so anyway, she she had found them again. She goes, they're right here. I mean, they were right on her, and they were they were growling. They were uh, telling her all kinds of stuff and telling her that they're not leaving. And uh, so anyway, my uh, we're kind of going to get into a controversial deal here. That I know I know that some people don't believe this, but. Uh, my sister and the lady was with her, got to praying in tongues, got to praying in the Spirit. And that's when things started happening. Two of them left immediately when that started. The third one stayed. That was the biggest one. And he kept saying, I am not leaving. I cannot leave here. I cannot leave here. And my sister said, Skip, this is your house. You're going to have to tell it to leave too. So I started demanding it to leave in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, again, we lost it. We lost it. Rebecca, Rebecca says, where is it? And through this through this whole time, they would, if, if Rebecca couldn't see them, this lady was with my sister or my sister won, the Holy Spirit would say, they're over here. They're over here. And they went through the house. And up in there, and they lost that last one. And Kelly says, is, is it gone? Rebecca says, no, I don't know where he's at, but he's still here. And about that time, the lady was with, with my sister goes, he's right there. And she pointed in that corner. And they went into that corner praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. After a little bit, he left. Now, this whole thing I told you took about two hours that we went through that night. And that was June the 13th, I believe, 2012. And uh, that's not my life changed forever. 
from this day forward, we have not had any problems. Uh, my daughter uh, had been starting to go to church, and the Lord had been starting to work on her a little bit right before this all happened. And after that, she had uh, had got saved. And uh, matter of fact, she got saved right before that. And then a few weeks later, she got filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, my wife, I had to call work that night and, and tell them that I wasn't coming to work. Of course, I didn't tell them what for. I just told them I was sick or something. But anyway, and so I picked my wife up at the airport the next day, and she says, uh, uh, what happened? Well, why are you picking me up? I said, well, I decided to take the day off and just come pick you guys up, pick up her and Zach. But uh, so on the way home, I'm telling her about what all went home and why she's going to see Bibles open on the table and Christian music playing. And uh, I don't know whether she believed me totally or not at that point. But that night after it was all over, there was such a peace over the house. That night, when I went back and sat on my bed, I rededicated I rededicated my life to the Lord. It was so hard hit. I was so hard headed and so stubborn. I wanted to do things my own way. That it took something like that to bring me back. Now, those first few months that I decided to give my life back to the Lord was a pretty good struggle. Pretty good struggle. And uh, I had some times there where I almost went back the other way. But I went to the altar of church one day and finished what happened that night on June the 13th. And uh, got my life straightened out. And I've been living for the Lord ever since. And uh, so from that point on, it was shortly after that. It was uh, two years ago, this last month. I've, I've been wanting to do this this last month. Uh, two years ago, April, we started this line. And when I started it, I had no idea where this was all going, and I still don't. But it's already been more than I imagined or bargained for or even planned. I didn't even think... To be honest with you, I didn't even figure we'd probably still be doing it by now. I just figured it'd kind of fizzle out because that's the way I've done things my whole life. I've never finished nothing I've ever started. I've always ended up messing it up. Other than uh, being married to my wife for maybe 26 years this year. But I almost messed that up come real close. But I've always, I've, I've screwed up so many things and uh, my prayer all the time anymore is, Lord, please don't let me mess up this part of my life. So we uh, got to talking to, it got to where um, Chuck started living for the Lord again. Doug Monta Smith started living for the Lord uh, Billy Bob had, had been in my life for quite a while. He'd been living for the Lord a long time, and he'd been a good influence on me. And I worked with Bill, and it got to where when we get talking at, at night, basically what we talked about after uh, we started, all of us started living right, that's all we would talk about was the Lord. And I got to talking to uh, Chuck and, and Greg and Doug and them. I said, well, to start us a little line, you know, and get up here and just read the Bible every once in a while, talk about this, that, and another. And so I remember the conference line that Bill had took me to years ago, a few years ago, but I wasn't ready. It turns out it was Brother Curtis's line. I'd been to another one, but it, was, it wasn't for me. I knew that. But uh, I do remember Curtis's line. And Anyway, long story short, uh, after I had given my life to the Lord, we, we started 
doing this wine thing. And uh, from that point on, uh, I got to uh, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like I say, I grew up Pentecostal, and I'm proud of my Pentecostal upbringing. I've seen the Holy Spirit do great things. I see the I see the the change it can make in people's lives. And I know I get feedback every once in a while from different directions that we talk about that too much up here. And I'm sorry, but I don't think we can talk about it enough. And I was I'd been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And on July the twelfth, twenty thirteen, a year after I'd rededicated my life to the Lord. We'd had a good night on the line and everybody had gotten where they were going and I was still out. I was I'd just gone through Clinton, Missouri when uh the last person got off the line. And we we had a good night, man, the Holy Spirit was still moving and still flowing. And I'm driving up the road and I got through that last flight at Clinton, got through my last years and I went right back into singing songs and praising the Lord. And uh if any of you are familiar with that part of the country, I got almost up to Urick, Missouri, which is a few miles north of Clinton, and I was singing Blessed Assurance. And uh I'd been praying, and I'd been I'd been praying for my grandkids who were living with me, and they were at church camp. And I'd been praying for them and singing that song, and I come up on the Uric exit, and I thought, oh, man, this is going to happen. So I hit that ramp, and nothing happened. Matter of fact, I sat up there and fell asleep for a minute. And I got to back up a minute. Uh... I'd been seeking that, and and uh, I would I would a couple of different times I had woke up dreaming in my sleep. I was praying in tongues. I'd wake up. I'd almost be right there when I woke up, but I'd stop myself. And I could uh, at different occasions, different times, I would feel the utterances swelling up within inside me, and I could feel them and hear them going off inside me, but I wasn't letting them out. And I got up to that Uric ramp that morning, and I pulled off to the ramp, thought it was going to happen, and stopped. And I sat there on that ramp, and I thought, oh, man, is this ever going to happen? And I sat back, I leaned my, I leaned my head back, and I remember thinking, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, and I fell asleep. I fell asleep for about 10 minutes. I woke up, and I thought, boy, that shows my dedication. I was talking to the Lord and fell asleep. So I got that thing back in gear and I took off. But before I took off, I said, Lord, whenever you think I'm ready for this gift, I've been seeking it. I just, whenever you think I'm ready, I just basically kind of give up, I guess. I don't know. I got that thing in gear and that the next exit is Creighton, Missouri. and That's four miles away from that ramp. I got this truck in gear, got the crew set. I went right back into singing, praising the Lord. And just a little bit before I got to that, come up on that crate and ramp, I could feel the utterances and the swelling up, the bubbling up, overflow feeling coming up with inside me. And I hit that ramp. And before I could get completely off the road, the utterances came out. (laughs) And I about blew the windshield out of this truck praying in an unknown tongue that I'd never heard before in my life that the presence of God come upon me in a way that it's never had before, ever, up to that point. And I sat on that exit ramp, and I prayed in tongues, and I laughed and I cried, and I, it literally has changed my life. It has literally changed my life. And that went on almost all day, off and on, even when I try to sleep. <laughs> and there's other things that went on that day that I won't get into. The Lord just showed me all kinds of stuff that day. I'll just leave it at that. I mean, it was it was something else. 
I've got it all written today, and one day maybe I'll get all that stuff out and read it, share it with you. But when that when that happened, when that happened, when I had that upper room experience for the very first time, it changed my life in such a way where basically all I think about was living for the Lord. And a month from that day, I was at the Kansas City, the Forest Avenue Women's Homeless Shelter, preaching a message. I would have never done that before. I took my guitar, I sang to those ladies, shared a message with them. My wife fixed them a good dinner, and that's been part of uh, what we do, basically what she does. She's the one that takes care of that. But that's something she's been doing ever since. And uh, this line is that happened, and uh, I look back at my life. Now, like I said, I don't know where all this is going. But I know it's it's, it's already been amazing. Um, I remember back when I was a little kid, my mom brought this to my memory here a while back, and, and I think she did it on the line, if I remember right. But she brought something back that I'd almost forgot about. She said when I was a little kid, and uh, I remember doing this now. I remember getting my desk out. And uh, if for some reason we wouldn't uh, make it to church on a Sunday evening, I'd go get my desk and I'd say, we're going to have church. And I'd get my desk out there and I'd get out there and we'd sing a few songs and I'd preach to them. And uh, a little later in life when I was telling you about Brother Jim Bradbury, that man prayed over me more than once. He just said, Skip, God's going to use you. God's going to use you. I want to finish telling the rest of this without it sounding like I'm bragging on me because it's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that I've done. It's not my charming personality. My uh, my grandmother died when I was 15. My dad, or my grandfather, married a woman named Dorothy. And uh, she used to tell me the same thing all the time. You're going to preach or something. The Lord's going to use you, Skip. And I remember Brother Jim saying, he's going to use you to do great things. And I look and I think, what would be so great? What could I do that would be so great? And when I, when I look at, when I will hear those words, you're going to do great things. God's going to use you to do great things for him. I'm thinking of the level of Billy Grant or Billy, Jimmy Swagger or some of that level, that type of greatness. And then I had someone prophesy over me right uh, right before the revival we had in March. And this, this person that prophesied over me is the real deal. It's not somebody that makes stuff up. He's a pastor, and he's he is the real deal. And then we went to the revival, and I got I got a I don't want to run out of time here, but we went the you know I get to thinking about great things. Lord's going to use you to great do great things. I got to thinking. I listened to Pastor John English's message the other day about God using you and stuff. And it dawned on me, we don't all have to be a Jimmy Swaggart or a 
or Billy Graham or whatever. For whatever reason, he's put me where I'm at right now. I hate doing what I'm doing. I hate driving a truck. I'm so sick of it. And the only thing that keeps me going is this line. He's got me where he wants me for a reason right now. He's crossed paths with people on this line for a reason right now. And where this is going from two years ago, I have no idea. But I've any time I ask somebody if they want to speak, yeah, I'll do it. I only had a couple of people tell me no or never call me back. There again, it's not my charm and personality. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. Doors are open, and uh, they keep opening. We're getting, we're starting the website. I, I got that started uh, last Friday. So, uh, like I said, I don't know where all this is going, but right before the uh, right around Christmas time, the Lord started showing me. people in a, in a auditorium type setting and people coming to the altars get saved till the Holy Spirit delivered healed and this was there was using huge numbers I believe he was showing me the future of what of future events that are coming but when I would when I was this wasn't these weren't dreams these were things he would show me while I was awake and uh, the Holy Spirit would come over me during these times where I would see this, and I'd just get to crying. And uh, I felt led to tell Brother English about it. And I remember telling him one time, I said, man, first, next time you get a little time, I'd like to share something with you that's just rolling around inside me. He said, Okay. And I thought that'll probably be the only time we ever talk about it. But these things kept happening to me and happening to me. And one day, uh, I, I felt led to uh, tell him I didn't feel led to go to my church for whatever reason or anybody else. I felt led to go to him, and I felt like I knew what he was going to do. And it happened just like, a, just like the Lord laid on my heart. But I was going to bed one day. I was laying there, and I seen my phone light. I already turned the ringer off and everything. I seen the phone light up, and it was John. He says, uh, hey, what are you going to tell me about what's rolling around inside you? I said, well, it's a lot to text, but I'll give it a whirl. So I, I text him, and uh, he, he come back, and he said, brother, he said, I believe this is God. He said, I'm getting, I'm getting chills. You tell me about this. I said, I don't know if I'm supposed to try to put something like this together or what, but I felt led to tell you. He said, brother, I don't know. He says, this is God. I know it is. He said, because of, you know, the feeling that I got. And he says, I'll, I'm with you, whatever you want to do. He said, if you want my church to hold an event like this, my church is yours for those three days. So that's how the revival got started. And before the revival was over, John came to me and said, I think we need to make this an annual event. So this is going to be an annual event. I just hope and pray that more of you can come this next year than was there this time. And I hope that you kind of plan, plan to attend because uh, it was an incredible experience. Uh, the, the Lord showed me in that uh, in the visions that He was showing me. He showed me uh, people that were destined for that weekend that had a divine appointment with God, and it was going to change their lives forever. They were going to get saved, they were going to get delivered, and so on. And that's exactly what happened. Every night of that revival, somebody got saved. And the last night we were there, I forget how many got saved that night, four or five. I think there were seven or eight, seven or eight that rededicated their life to the Lord. There was probably half a dozen that got filled with the Holy Ghost, and there were several of them that got uh, healed. 
And it's all because the Lord is using the people that are connected to this line. He gives me a thought or a vision or whatever, and he shared it with I shared it with John. And John coming into our life was no accident. All these things are happening. This is all going somewhere. And I remember John the last night of the, the service. John didn't even get to preach. All that went on that night. Those people got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, all that. God had to push the, the first three rows back so the altars were full. He looked at me in the middle of the praise and worship. He said, Brother, we're about to lose this service. And he says, I, I, he, the first, he says, I feel like we need to make an altar call right in the middle of praise and worship. And he did. And, uh, the rest, it just, I mean, the Holy Spirit just took over. And he said, brother, we're about to lose this service. And we did. And the Holy Spirit took it, did what he needed to do. And I remember him coming up to me and him grabbing me and hugging me. He said, brother, this is just our first of many rodeos together. We were just crying and hugging. And I thank God for our paths crossing. I'm going to love this man. He's... He's, there's not a day goes by that I don't talk to him in one shape or, or another. I text or my phone. I remember Brother Greg coming up to me. He put his arm around me. He said, is this anything like what you see in those visions? I said, man, oh, man. But that's what he showed me in those visions. That was, this was just a taste of what happened that night, I believe. I believe we're going to eventually need a bigger place. And those auditorium type buildings are going to be filled with people. And people coming to the altar, people coming to know the Lord. Lives being changed. All because of whatever God's got planned for this line. So I got to thinking about that. No. Nobody on this line is a Billy Graham. Nobody on this line is a Jimmy Swagger or Joe Holstein. But you don't have to have great big numbers to do great things for God. Those words that preacher Jim Bradbury spoke over me and my grandfather's wife, Dorothy, but he usually do do great things. I'm raising my grandkids. That's a great thing. It's a great thing for God. And I don't know about the rest of y'all, if this touched any of you like it's touched me, but I'm just going to tell you, this is just the beginning. We're all in this for a reason. And this is going to go as far as God, as, this is going to go as far as we'll let God take it, if that makes any sense. And I myself are all in. I can't wait for the website to get up and going. Um, it's, it's new territory for me. I absolutely know nothing about it. But I can't wait for it to get up and going. And here again, if it hadn't been for running across John, I, the stuff about using Facebook as part of the ministry, getting a website, None of this stuff would have been possible. And I know I kind of jumped around and I was all over the place. But this has been quite a ride, as Curtis is always saying, strap yourself in. This has been quite a ride, and we're not done yet. We ain't even to the top of that big old roller coaster, the biggest old hill before you start down through the switchbacks. We're still climbing. And like I said, it's going to go as far as we'll let God to allow God to take it. And I'm ready, and I'm in, and I'm, I can't wait to see what else he's got in store for us, and I hope you all are too. I just pray that you all are blessed. I love each and every one of you, the Lord. <laughs> and I thank you so much for being a part of this. And I tell you, I told that story about my dad for one reason. 
the grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. And the decisions you make in your life with your kids or your grandkids affects them for the rest of their lives unless God intervenes and changes their heart. And I almost followed that same path as my dad did. And I thank God that I did it. There's been times it's been tough. And I'm not just talking to men. I'm talking to women, too. The grass is not greener on the other side. There are times I do believe when we, the Lord will allow us to get out of a situation. But for the most part, our situations are situations we've created ourselves that we just don't feel like messing with it no more. We need to get about the back of Father's business, get him in our in our relationships, and let him take care of it. So don't don't think that things are better down the road or on the other side of the fence because they're not. They just get worse. With that, I'll close. Lord, just thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this line. I thank you so much for uh, putting the idea in our heads to to start this line, and only you know what lies ahead, Lord. And I just pray, continue to pray, that I will not mess this up. Give me what I need to stay out of your way unless you have control. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.